this is pretty cool. I, I don't have seminary training. I'm not Pastor David, <laughs> but I have the privilege to share the Word of God with you all this morning. And because this is my first ever sermon, uh, full-length sermon, yeah, let's go ahead and pray one more time, because uh, I, I could use all the prayer we can get. So, Father, thank you, Lord, for just your gathering of your people this morning. Thank you, Lord, for the truths that we've already shared, reminded ourselves of this morning in song and in communion. Lord, thank you for the truths that we have in your word. Lord, I pray that you just guide your word through my lips, that I would proclaim truth well for your glory, Lord, and that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be acceptable in your sight, O Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. So, (laughs) this morning we're going to be talking about image-bearing and gift-giving in the church. And Pastor Scott's been taking us through Acts, and we've been um, learning about Jesus for everywhere. But right now, we're going to be taking a, a detour and skipping a few uh, books of the Bible down to 1 Corinthians. And um, we're going to be learning about the church. We're going to be learning about image bearing and gift giving. So first, before I read our scripture this morning, I'm going to give some context on 1 Corinthians. Uh, Paul is writing to so Paul, this character named Paul. In Acts, we just learned about this dude named Saul, who, uh, spoiler alert, he becomes Paul, the apostle, who's responsible for most of our New Testament. And God uses him to start and grow the early church across the world. So Corinth, this book of 1 Corinthians, it's a letter to a church in Corinth. Corinth was a strategic city in Greece, and Paul spent time there as a missionary, and that local church grew. And we're going to learn about that later in Acts as we get there, probably in 2025, right, Scott? And Paul was getting, yeah, if we're lucky, Paul was getting some reports that things were not going so great in Corinth. And he spent a lot of this letter instructing the church and correcting specific behaviors. Uh, He first addresses divisions. There were people that were kind of separated by their favorite leader of choice. I follow Paul. I follow Apollos. He spends a lot of time... um, Uh, with a lot of warnings against sexual immorality. He provides instructions on marriage and singleness, on widows in the church. Uh, He discusses food offered to idols, warnings against idolatry, and he also gives instructions on how to take the Lord's Supper, which is the chapter before the one we're going to be reading today. And then we come to chapter 12, instructions concerning spiritual gifts. And so our text this morning is 1 Corinthians 12, verses 4 through 7, and then I'm going to skip and do verses 12 through 20. So if you have your Bibles, please turn there, open there, scroll there, um, and we, we can read together, follow along as I read. First Corinthians 12, verses 4 through 7. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all and everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Skipping to verse 12. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one Spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, well, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, well, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. May God bless the reading of his word. So this appears to be a response to some specific questions or issues that the church had regarding gifts. Um, And verses 4 through 7 set the stage for our message this morning. There are a variety of gifts, but the same spirit. There are varieties of service, but the same Lord. There are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all and everyone. I think Paul wants to remind the church in Corinth of the source of these gifts because perhaps they've been too focused on the gifts instead of the giver. And even we, 
we today still have a lot of questions about gifts. Uh, the Questioner's Cafe I, <laughs> at Scott and Lori. Those are really cool, by the way. I hope everyone can go to the next one. It's Tuesday, right? Uh, I asked a question about spiritual gifts, and we spent a lot of time talking about that, didn't we? For those of you who are there. Um, so I think Paul wants to start out his response by refocusing the Corinthians on the nature of God. He is pointing the church back to God, the giver, the source of these gifts. He is what gift giving is all about, not us. What we see here with those three different words, Spirit, Lord, and God, this is a reference to the Holy Trinity, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This triune God wants to give a manifestation of the Spirit for the common good of every believer in the church. And so this morning, before we jump into how God has composed the body of Christ, we need to be reminded of this God and this image that we are designed to reflect. So this morning, we're going to be discussing, as I said, image-bearing and gift-giving in the church. So point number one, the image of God expressed in oneness. The image of God expressed in oneness. Well, the image of God is that he is one. We are monotheists. We believe in one God. The Trinity does not consist of three separate gods, but three different persons who are of the same essence. John chapter 14 Verses 9 through 10, Jesus said to him, so he's responding to Philip, (laughs) have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, yes, how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Here it says, Jesus and and the Father are one. I am in the Father. The Father is in me. There is oneness here. But notice this oneness isn't an isolated or a disconnected oneness. There is relationship in this oneness. Scripture teaches us here that God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit have always been in perfect harmony before the world was made. Each member of the Trinity has always been perfectly pouring love and glorifying each other since before time began. And we see Jesus point to this during his high priestly prayer in John chapter 17. John 17, and this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. So before the world existed, Jesus and the Father were one. They were together The glory that I had with you speaks to that indescribable bond found within the Trinity and the overwhelming glory that comes from being within the presence of this bond. And then later in verse 24, which I don't think we have a slide for that one, I'll just read it. Jesus again is praying to his Father, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. So there it is again. This glory, this this love between the members of the Trinity, it has existed before the foundation of the world. And throughout Scripture, we see God refer to oneness, unity, togetherness, because I believe this is an expression of the imago Dei, the image of God. This is one of the pictures that God gives us of himself. And later, this morning, we'll look at what that looks like in the church. But if you want to know what the image of God looks like, it looks like an interconnected oneness, one source of life, one source of glory. Point number two, the image of God expressed in distinctness. The Trinity is also where we see the image of God expressed in three distinct roles, and I think their distinctiveness matters. Each person of the triune God has a distinct role that plays out in perfect harmony with the rest of the Trinity. God is in perfect union with the Son and the Spirit. So back to the high priestly prayer in John 17. Again, And this is eternal life that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. So notice here, Jesus was sent. Jesus had work to do. This wasn't the Father's role, nor was it the Holy Spirit's role. It was Jesus who came to be born as a man, to take on flesh, to die on a cross and be risen from the dead. It was Jesus who had that job. That was his job description. John 14, verses 16 through 17. Jesus says, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth, 
whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. And then later in John chapter 14, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. So Jesus here is mentioning a helper, the Holy Spirit. He will be with us forever. This is the role of the Holy Spirit, not Jesus. Where is Jesus right now? He is risen. He's ascended into heaven. He's seated at the right hand of God the Father. But he sent his Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is what equips us, renews us for our Christian walk. The Spirit sanctifies us. The Spirit keeps us moving in the direction that Jesus would have us go as, as his followers, as his disciples. So each member of the Trinity brings glory to God by fulfilling their roles perfectly. The three persons of the Trinity, they lack nothing. So they're constantly pouring streams of love and glory into one another, and there's perfect harmony to be found in God. Without angels, without us, without the earth, without creation, they lack nothing. They're perfect. They don't need us. They, God doesn't need us. But he chose to create. And we humans, Scripture teaches us, are the masterpiece of his creation. His love overflowed into the dust of the earth, and he formed us from the dust, and he breathed life into us. And Scripture teaches us that we became his image bearers. So in Genesis 1, immediately after it says God created man in his own image, it says male and female, he created them. He immediately makes a distinction between the two sexes. So clearly the distinctness of male and female matter to God. To have a direct relationship to the image of God. Before the man and the woman become one flesh, so there it is again, distinctness, oneness, before they have relationship and they're together, they're bound as one flesh, they were distinct. The man was created from the dust, the woman was taken from the man's rib. Genesis 1.27, so God created man in his own image, in the image of God he created him, male and female, he created them. There's no stop, it goes straight into that distinct, that distinction, those distinctions between the two sexes. Point number three, the image of God expressed by his gift giving. This perfect love and outpouring of goodness and grace, it moved God to share it with us. So this is the story of creation in the garden, right? God is pouring out his love into his creation. Man has never been closer to God, right? In that perfect harmony, experiencing God's love in the garden. And God said, well, it's not good for Adam to be alone. So he gave Adam Eve. Also, Genesis 1, we see, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. God is giving, he's giving, he's giving. God gave them everything they needed and it was good. And those gifts were never meant to satisfy us. The gifts were intended to point us back to the giver himself. I give you these gifts and it's a, just a token, an expression of my love, of my image. Through a relationship with the triune God, perfectly in harmony with him and basking in the nearness and connectedness we had with God in the garden, through our unity with him, we were to receive life and enjoy him. That's God's design. So an inseparable part of image bearing is therefore gift giving. But how did we humans respond to this, to all these gifts? We, <laughs> another spoiler alert. We rejected God. We chose to love the gift more than the giver. And we decided that we can find life and happiness apart from the giver and do it on our own. Obviously, that's not true. But that's what we call sin. That's what the Bible calls sin. That's separation from God. And the rest of history and Scripture is a picture of God constantly pouring out gifts. Again, giving and giving and giving. He's pouring out gifts upon his creation in spite of our sin. The story of Genesis goes to Abram. God calls Abram out of uh, a nation and says, I'm going to make you different. I'm going to make you special. He gave Abram a new name, Abraham. He gave Abraham a promise. He gave Abraham a son. And even though Abraham tried to do this whole son thing on his own in a, in a sinful way, God still gives him a son. He still fulfills his promises. God gave Israel the Passover lamb as a substitute to save them from the plague against Egypt, right? God gave Israel manna from heaven, and water from the rock when they were hungry and thirsty in the wilderness, and they were being jerks, <laughs> and God still gave it to them. God gave Israel the promised land. He promised it. He gave it to them. He gave Israel victories over their enemies, lots of them, and this plan of giving and giving and giving points to his, 
his master plan of giving them a savior. Ezekiel 36, Scott referenced it during communion. Ezekiel 36, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. God gave Israel the Messiah. For unto us a son is given. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. The natural question here is like, why? Why does God keep giving all these gifts? It's so that we can have a relationship with him again. Even though we rejected him, said, I don't want a relationship with you. I'm good with these gifts you've given me. He still has a heart that says, no, come back. I want you. I, I, I don't need you. I'm in perfect harmony here being God. I don't need you, but I love you and I want you. I care for you. The gospel is that good news that even though we were sinners, through Jesus Christ, we have forgiveness of sins, a new heart and a new life that we get to live with him as part of his family. Philippians it says that Jesus, though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a, theme to be, a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself. Again, we see this, the image of God, God emptying himself, giving of himself through Jesus. So even though Jesus was one with God in perfect harmony and inexpressible glory, he emptied himself. A relationship with God is the ultimate gift. And Jesus tells us to remain in him, abide in him. That's where we find life. So God's design behind all of this gift giving is that we are reunited with God, reconnected into a relationship with him. He's the source of our, of our life. And three results of God's gift giving. John chapter 15. I'm spending a lot of time in John. <laughs> we got to go here before we get into the Corinthians part. John 15, verses 8 through 11. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. So one, the first result of God's giving, gift giving, that you bear much fruit. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. So that's the second result of all this gift giving, that we're, that we're filled with joy. We have the joy of Jesus. So again, it's that oneness, that distinctness, that perfect harmony, that perfect outpouring of love that we see in the Trinity. He's imparting that to, to us if we abide in him, if we have a relationship with him, if we obey him, we find joy. And that joy isn't just a, a little joy, it's fullness of joy. It's that same joy that God has. He's giving it to us. And the third result, John 17 one more John. <laughs> the high priestly prayer again. Jesus is saying, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. There it is, oneness. Just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. So there's the third result. The world will believe. They will come to know Jesus. The glory that you've given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me. The world needs, God's not just done with you. When, <laughs> he doesn't just want to save you. There's a whole family that he's drawing to himself. We don't know who, every, who everyone is that's going to be a part of this family, but we know, Scripture teaches us here, a part of being and abiding in Christ draws people. It draws people from the world into this family so that they know, so that they'll believe. So as image bearers, we resemble him. We are his children, and thus we are capable of this oneness and this togetherness. Using our unique giftedness to love and pour ourselves and our energy into others, just as we've seen in the Trinity. And as image bearers, where oneness and distinctness both matter, we need to be reminded that we are now a part of a new family that is designed to resemble and reflect the image of God. So that's point number four. The image of God expressed in a new family. So when I got married to my beautiful bride, Renee, almost 16 years ago, I married into my wife's family. And she married into my family. And there's my mom and my dad there too. Woohoo! When you get married, you're a part of, you become a part of a family that you didn't know before. You've got a new family tree. Uh, this is what we see in the body of Christ. 
As soon as you believe, immediately, you have new brothers, new sisters, grandmas, grandpas, crazy uncles that you didn't have before. And um, that's beautiful. We, we had a memorial service for Renee's grandpa on Friday, and there was an interesting cast of characters there. It was a patchwork of personalities. And, and I was taken back by just uh, how Renee's grandpa's life, it, it was just, there was lots of stories about his life and how he was interwoven in just really interesting ways with other peoples and other uh, communities. And um, I, I just looking at that, I was like, this is the way God works. It's not the way that we would expect it necessarily, but it's the way God works. And one example was that uh, Grandpa Larry, he's from Native American descent, and Renee's grandma is from Iceland. Those two going together, just like, <laughs> that's different, right? That's unique. And not only that, but they ended up living in a town called Geisela. Uh, you guys know Geisela? Anybody know Geisela, Arizona? It's close to Payson. It's like down the hill from Payson, right? But in that same small town, there was another woman from Iceland there that they became friends with. I'm like, this is crazy. And she was at the, at the service and just sharing how that was special to her. Not only that, but one other way that it was uh, just a strange connection, uh, he had spent time in Louisiana, and she had some connection to Louisiana too, and there was like Cajun food, so she'd make it. They had somebody in Geisela, Arizona of all places, to share this love for Cajun food. I thought that was cool. And who, who would have thought, right? This is God's design. Uh, it's messy at times. Our, our new family can be messy. Our, our uh, biological families can be messy. It's surprising at times. It's not always what we would expect, but it's beautiful. And God is this master designer of our relationships. So we severed our relationship with this gift-giving God when we sinned. But when we come to know Jesus as our Savior, we die to our old selves, and we are raised with Christ into this new family that Scripture calls the body of Christ. So finally, back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through 13. For just as the body is one and has many members... And all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. So there it is again. We see oneness and distinctness. And Paul is using the body as a great metaphor for this church, this new family, as God's image bearers. So let's think about that for a moment, about bodies. You have one body you have limitations. You are singular. Now, even if you have multiple personalities, yeah, or multiple hobbies or vacations, sorry, I meant vocations, uh, interests or facets, you are an individual. You are bound by physical limitations. You are not omnipresent. You are bound by relational limitations. You can't possibly meet and know everyone. Your body doesn't belong to another person either, unless you're married, Mark 10, 8. But when we encounter the gospel and believe, this singular person becomes a part of a new family. Our salvation isn't just a personal relationship with Jesus. It's a new corporate relationship with other believers. And as a body, as part of a, a church family, we can now meet more people. We can now minister to more people than you could as a single individual, right? We can go more places. We can do more things. We can go to Mexico, right? We can get backpacks for kids at school. We, we can go to Slovenia, right? Wherever. Uh, we believers in Jesus, we're all dead to our old selves. The old has died, crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who lives, but Christ lives in me. And Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. We are immediately raised to newness of life and a part of the church consisting of all believers from every corner of the globe. So the picture Jesus has given us to reflect this event in the church, it's baptism. We come to the waters dead in our transgressions. Our deadness dies. We die and we're cleansed by Jesus and raised up out of the waters, in the, up in the Spirit, right? Immediately, when, at conversion, the Spirit is given to us and we are made to drink of this one Spirit. And as part of that, it's, Scripture's teaching us that we are given gifts. So Scripture calls this new family the body of Christ and I want to think a little bit about the body of Christ for a moment. How is the local church like the body of Christ? He became man, he took on flesh and he lived with us. So the fullness of God placed in a human body, Jesus, right? A singular man, one member of the Trinity, but he was on earth at a specific time and place. He was Jesus of Nazareth, not Jesus of Gizela. 
So it is with the local church. We are Missy O'Day and Chandler. We aren't also in Payson or Kentucky or Mozambique. Yes, the global worldwide church is spreading to all of those places, praise God, but we are placed here now, and that is a part of God's design. And I think there's something to be said here about uh, virtual church. A body is not virtual. You are not your digital avatar in the metaverse. Your identity is not who you are on TikTok. Neither is the church. I believe part of God's design for us as image bearers is that we should belong to a local church, a singular time and space bound assembly or gathering of believers in a local church. Church hopping, it happens from time to time, but you should be committed. You should be a part of a local assembly, a gathering, so that you can develop those relationships and be image bearers and reflect God's image in this way. Another way I think that the local church is like the body of Christ, he said his body is the bread of life. And being a part of that local church body is where we can encounter and partake of the bread of life together. We are devoted to the teaching of the word here. We don't just get together and drink coffee. The word is what gives us life. Uh, Jesus says, man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from God, right? From the Father. We also remember Jesus' death and we take communion. We did it this morning. Another way I think is that we see that obviously Jesus' body was broken on the cross. We can expect to be broken, but we go to a church, a local body of church that can help us in our brokenness, that can help us in our suffering. We suffer together. And then obviously, Scripture tells us his body was re- resurrected. We have this hope to look forward to as a local body, that we will all be resurrected as well, not just by ourselves individually, but the entire body of believers, we will be joining in heaven and worshiping our risen Lord and Savior together forever. Point number five, the image of God expressed in purposeful personhood. The church also reflects the image of God in that we have a purposeful personhood. Going back to verse four, uh, we see variety of gifts, but the same spirit. Variety of service, but the same Lord. Variety of activities or effects, but the same God who works in every person. So there, there's a triplet here. Spirit, Jesus, God the Father. And that shows us both oneness and distinctness, right? And then gifts, service, activities, or effects. There's variety and diversity of these things, but they're coming from the same single source. And I just wanted to highlight in verse 5, that word service in the Greek is the same word for deacon that Scott preached on in Acts 6, verses 2. Remember the waiting tables? It says they're deacons. So Paul's just showing that there's a variety of these things. It's not all about one or, or another. These gifts aren't better than one another. There's a variety of them, and they're all coming from the same God. And that they're given by, every, uh, given by the Spirit to every believer for what? For the common good of the church. So some of the gifts mentioned in Scripture are very specific, and some are quite broad. But no matter what you believe about spiritual gifts, if you're a hardcore cessationist or a continuationist, whether you think gifts are still happening or some of these gifts aren't anymore, or, or the differences between gifts and service, uh, wherever you stand on these issues, whether the lists of gifts are exhaustive or representative, the Bible is clear that no matter what you believe there, we are to use our giftedness and our talents to glorify God. Everything he's given you as a gift giver should now be given back to God. It should be given back to the local church to, to serve your local community. 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. So our unique giftedness that God's blessed us with, our interests, our skills, whether it's passed down from our family tree or learned as a part of our experiences, all of this now is reclaimed by the Holy Spirit and can and should be used to be building up the kingdom of God. This gives purpose to our personhood. Notice how Paul spells out Jews or Greeks, slaves or free. The attributes that used to divide us are now a part of our new union with the body. Our different backgrounds, our different cultural identities, our political affiliations, our ethnicities, the color of our skin, all are now crucified We are no longer to live in these distinctions. 
We are no longer to find our life in these distinctions or in our uniqueness. We submit these distinctions to God. And instead of saying to us, well, now that you're a Christian, these distinctions don't matter anymore. Get rid of them. He says, nope, I'm going to use them. Your you-ness, your uniqueness now has a new purpose to serve, to build up, to love others. I love that you are different, God says. I love that you are unique. I made you that way. I knit you together. I formed you in your mother's womb. I know you. But now you are a part of something bigger than yourself, a family that will never end. You are a part of a symphony of service, a new mosaic of ministry that God is using to draw more and more image bearers to himself to bring glory and life and fullness of joy. For the body does not consist of one member but of many. If the foot should say, well, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, well, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, well, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. So there's a lot that we could talk about here. (laughs) I guess I just want to know, well, why might the foot say I am not a hand? Why would the ear dare to say I am not an eye? And this is ridiculous, right? But I think it speaks to maybe some lies that we might be listening to. Maybe there's voices in our head that tell us lies, well, you don't matter. So I've got three lies. There might be more of that, more than three. Number one, I'm not gifted. Yes, you are. If you're a believer, verse 6 says God empowers everyone. You are gifted. You, you may not know what your gift is, but you're gifted. Another one, my gift isn't as important as someone else's. So maybe the ear thinks that the hands are more important. Or maybe the eye thinks that the nose is more important. I don't know. Yes, your gift is as important as someone else. In fact, later in verse 22, which we won't get to this morning, it says the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. I think this applies to us here at Missio Dei as well. We shouldn't be comparing ourselves to other churches. It doesn't matter if we have 5,000 people here or 50. God has arranged us as he chooses. And then there's, we'll flip it around, right? You think you're the hand, so you're the big shot, right? I'm the hands of the body. I get to do all the work. My gift is more important than others. Well, some gifts may be more noticeable or in the public eye, but that doesn't equate to value. Jesus was known for reaching out to those who were considered less important, wasn't, didn't he? he? He always was seeking out those who were in the margins of society, the outcasts, the sinners, the tax collectors, women. Our distinctions, our personhood, what makes us unique from others, they are important to God. God doesn't want a homogenous kingdom where everyone looks and thinks and talks the same. Our giftedness does play an important role. And uh, this, this is where we get to look at the hockey team full of goalies. I just thought this, this photo was funny. Can you imagine a game of, like, only goalies? We're a hockey family, so forgive me. I know not everybody likes this sport, but this is clearly a goalie camp. They're training to be better goalies. But imagine if a game was, like, everybody just wanted to be goalie. Who's going to score the goals here? Who's going to? I mean, they're all, they're all prepared to stop and catch a, a puck, but... Yeah, exactly. Uh, so it's okay. So this reminds me of gathering and scattering. The goalies gathered for a, for a goalie camp. And that's okay. You, sometimes when you have uh, unique gifts, you might want to gather with others who, who have that same gift so that you can be better equipped so they can sharpen one another. But then you need to scatter. The goalies all got to go back to their own team. <laughs> another, uh, another image that stuck with me. Check out all these uh, tuba players tuba or euphonium convention here. Imagine an orchestra of all tuba. I don't think you can do Beethoven's Ninth with uh, only tubas or euphoniums. I mean, you you could try. And again, this is probably just a tuba and euphonium workshop. They gather, but then they're going to scatter and go play tuba and all of their different orchestras, right? Instead of focusing on gifts or our roles, whether we're a hand, whether we're a foot, whether we're an ear, whatever, again, Focus on the giver. Focus on the giver and let God use you in whatever way he sees fit. So uh, we don't have photos for this, but uh, a couple weeks ago, we went to Mexico. We were building a house. That was awesome. It was really exciting. I'd never done that before. And I don't know how to build a house. I don't know. know, That's not my gift. I'm not a house builder guy. I'm not a construction guy. Uh, my parents are musicians, so I, I was an artist, music, you know, kind of guy, right? Um, 
But other people did, and they taught me. And I was there to serve and be used however God would have me within the context of building a house. Sometimes you're the stucco guy, right? And that's what I was. I was the stucco person. Sometimes you're on the roof, right? You're using the hammer and building that roof. But whatever it is, you can be used. You can be a part of the symphony of service. And I was grateful for Merlin, too. He was, he was teaching me how to do all that stuff. Finally, what does this look like in everyday life? Point number six, the image of God expressed in daily living. Three points, three ways that I think this image bearing will look like in our daily living as part of the body together. That's number one, togetherness. Togetherness. The greatest moments of our lives, think about it, they're lived out in relationship with others. Weddings, you know, the birth of a child. You, you celebrate with others or you, you experience all of this joy with others. I think this is true of the church. We need to not forsake the assembly. We need to be physically meeting with one another in person. We need to be a part of one another's lives. You can't do that on the sidelines. You can't do that when you're distant. This is the image of God in the body of Christ. They're together. We need to be together. We need each other. We sharpen each other. We encourage one another. We confess sins to each other. We grow together in Christ. We pray for each other. Thank you for praying for, for my family. Thank you for praying. We read the word of God together. We wrestle with difficult questions on Questioner's Cafe together. We go and have pool parties and pizza parties together. This is cool. This, is the, this reflects the image of God. And we need to bear one another's burdens together. It's hard to do these things when we're not meeting together. So Christians, let's be meeting together. Let's be together. Number two, we need to recognize gifts in one another. We need to recognize the giftedness and, and the talents and the spiritual gifts that we see in other people. When you interact with someone else from a church, is that how you view them as somebody that's been gifted? If they think differently than you on a particular topic, I mean, do you see that as a problem as a, or as an opportunity to maybe grow together, to, to have a difficult discussion? These are good things. We're following Jesus together. He doesn't say it's going to be easy. Do we receive one another's gifts? When someone has a gift, they want to give it. Be a good receiver of that gift. Say yes. Be willing to receive those gifts. Do we, do we acknowledge them? Do we say, hey, you know what, Angie, you're really good at X, Y, Z. Yeah, you're good at X, Y, Z. Yeah, yeah. Someone else is A, B, C. Yeah. Um, do we let others bless us when we need it? When you need help, are you asking for help? Are you willing to receive help? That's hard. We don't want to be in need, right? We don't like being needy. We don't like asking for help. Do we express gratitude? Do we say, thank you for your gift? Thank you for your photography. Thank you, Josh, for your guitar music. And uh, do we ask for help? Okay, we already did that one. I think we should be recognizing gifts in one another and be more vocal about it and, and saying, hey, you're gifted. I love how you help us with this. And number three, give of yourself. Be willing to give. Uh, this is cool. There's an experience that musicians or athletes or performers, uh, they speak about in a secular context where they are in the zone. Have you guys heard about this? Or is this just me? I don't know. It's like when everyone is playing the role perfectly in harmony with everyone else. Perhaps you've experienced this. Like you had a really great show, right? Or your work, everybody was working together really well and you put on a great you know, dinner service, whatever it is. Um, I've personally experienced this in improv comedy and in music. It's, it's just kind of um, a result of when everyone has fully submitted their talents, their efforts, their preparation, their affections to do something amazing for someone else, right? To put on a great show, uh, whatever it is, right? This is the zone. We start to feel this like, I'm not even paying attention to myself. I don't even know what I'm doing, and it's just happening, and God's using it. Imagine, so if, if we can experience that in a secular context, and non-believers can experience it too, imagine how much greater impact and, and uh, expression we can have as the church, where we find that giftedness, the commitment, the disciplined teammates, the harmony, the opportunity to serve, to love, that's when we might find ourselves in the zone. We now have the God-given gift of giving gifts for God. Do you love to help and serve? Serve. 
Do you have compassion and a heart for those who are in need? Thank you. Go meet with them and bring others with you. Do you have money? Give it away. Do you have a voice? Sing or speak if you don't if you're not a singing voice. Maybe you're a speaking voice. You want to speak words of encouragement. Do you have ideas on how to equip others? Lead. Do you make amazing cakes? Feed. <laughs> Do you have a truck? Go help a complete stranger move because you know you're going to get asked to help him move anyway. Why not? It's a gift. Give it away. Gifts given to give away. So um, how am I doing on time? Okay. I'm, well, I'm ready to close. So we're going to close with this. There's this picture that uh, wouldn't leave me all week about on this topic of gift giving. Um, so at Christmas time when we're kids, you know, mom and dad, um, I'm, I'm thinking of like, you know, like a toddler age, maybe three, four, five years old, where mom's giving a gift to dad. And this is the picture. She's done all the work. She selected the gift. She purchased it. She wrapped it. She put the bow on it. She put the tag on it. Everything's ready to go. And she says, hey, you know, she's calling her, her son maybe or her child. Can you give this one to daddy? Right? You see the eyes light up on this little child's face like, oh, yeah, I, I got a special job. This is awesome. And then he gives it to dad. Dad's eyes are lit up, and there's just this joy there. Think about that picture for a moment. The, the kid, the toddler, didn't have to do anything. They didn't buy it. They didn't wrap it. If they did, it'd probably be a disaster, right? All they had to do was receive it and then give it. Receive that gift and then give it. They don't even need to know what's inside it. They don't need to open it up. It doesn't matter. All they have to do is give it. So in that picture, this brings mom greater joy because she blesses both the child and the dad. It brings the child joy because they, they're just excited to participate. They have a special job, and they get to see the smile on dad's face, right? And it brings dad joy because the gift reminds him of his wife's love, and he gets to see how excited his child is to give it to him. There's joy in this picture. That's what it is for us as God's children. He's given you his image of gift giving. All you have to do is give it, receive and give. So this week, let's go out and be image bearers and gift givers. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your endless supply of gifts and grace and mercy that you pour out on us even while we're sinning. Even while we're rejecting your gifts, you're still giving us gifts. And Father, thank you for the ultimate gift we have in Jesus Christ. Thank you that you've called us out of darkness and into a new family, into newness of life. Lord, I pray that you would help us to get our eyes off of our giftedness or our failures, our weakness. Lord, help us to get our eyes on, on Jesus. Help us to stay focused on you, on your truths. And Lord, use us for your glory, for your purposes, for the works that you've already prepared in advance for us to do. Lord, help us to submit our hearts. Help us to submit our affections. Help us to submit our uniqueness and our personhood to you, Lord. Help us to be fully submitted, fully committed, fully devoted to you and what you would have us do. And Lord, help us as we seek to do this together corporately as a body, as a local church community, Lord. Help us to be together. Help us to be united. Help us to recognize giftedness and distinctness in other members of our church. And Lord, help us as we seek to just give and love and to be the hands and feet of Jesus. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.